is to worry serious but it will happen yes yes so happy independence day yes murdula happy happy independence day yes yes of course um <laughs> i think we are uh, ready to start okay whenever you say give me uh, you will start somebody will my turn is going to come much later so yes, once you start i will relax <laughs> and how much time do you think you are going to take after the lecture because you have some 10 discussants lined up mam half an hour or 40 45 minutes okay yes okay right simi we can start now my 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 simi and should we mute when you are with others yes i know yes अपनी आजादी को हम हरगिज मिटा सकते ही नहीं एंड देयर फोर वी हैव ऑल गैदर्ड हियर ऑन द ऑस्पिशियस ओकेजन ऑफ इंडियाज सेवेंटी फोर्थ इंडिपेंडेंस डे टू बी अ टेस्टिमनी टू अ डिस्टिंग्विश्ड लेक्चर फ्रॉम द लेंस ऑफ अ हिस्टोरियन फ्रॉम नन अदर दैन द एक्सपर्ट हरसेल्फ प्रोफेसर मृदुला मुखर्जी ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ इंपैक्ट एंड पॉलिसी रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट आई सिमी मेहता वेलकम यू ऑल दिस इवनिंग टू रीविजिट द विजन ऑफ द इंडियन नेशन in the era of covid-19 pandemic as we aim to build an atmanirbhar bharat with these few words i invite dr arjun kumar director of impact and policy research institute to moderate the session i wish you all a very happy independence day jai hind thank you thank you sumit and welcome everyone for this very distinguished lecture by professor mridula ma'am and uh, uh, without wasting any much time now i invite uh, professor bharat singh to formally introduce chair for today's evening talk uh, professor bharat singh uh, hello all the distinguished uh, participants of this uh, very good program and uh, at the outset i would like to convey my uh, best wishes for uh, uh, the, this independence day the 74th independence day to all of you and uh, <clears throat> uh professor salil misra uh, is a well known personality in the academic world he needs no uh, introduction uh, however as a matter of courtesy uh, i would uh, give you the uh, brief uh, profile of uh, professor misra professor, uh, professor could uh, just uh, turn on your video okay sorry sorry thank you yeah Uh, professor salil misra is uh, pro vice chancellor too at uh, dr b r ambedkar university delhi where he is also dean of the school of law governance and citizenship and also professor at the school of liberal studies his areas of expertise is modern indian history with a special focus on the indian national movement communal politics partition of the subcontinent politics of language hindi and urdu nationalism identity politics and social science teaching professor misra has previously taught history at the department of history and culture jamia millia islamia and at indira gandhi national open university he was also an <clears throat> assistant research officer at the nehru memorial museum and library he has been with the ambedkar university delhi since october 2010 as professor in history at the school of liberal studies professor misra has written two books a narrative of communal politics uttar pradesh 1937 39 and a monograph entitled swaraj party or in hindi brought out by the national book trust uh, nbt new delhi in 1997 he has over 20 research articles in books and journals on various themes and over 40 articles at popular level of uh, for several national dailies he has also <coughs> Uh, been associated with various projects such as towards freedom sponsored by indian council of historical research a collection of documents on the freedom struggle for the year 1942 and as a visiting researcher at the center for history of emotions uh, max planck history of emotions max planck institute for human development berlin he produced a monograph on emotions in politics and politics of emotions 
making of a Muslim nation in colonial India, 1937-46. Thank you very much. Welcome, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome. Welcome, Professor Salim Mishra, sir. Now we can uh, formally have chair's remarks over the event. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. I am very happy that I was chosen to preside over this very important event. Uh, the vision of the Indian nation in times of coronavirus. And uh, the uh, the main speaker for today's lecture is uh, Professor Murdula Mukherjee, uh, who, who's sure who's going to be introduced uh, by the by someone from the Institute. So I will not introduce her, except to say that uh, uh, many of us here in this meeting have been Murdula Mukherjee's student. She was in JNU and she taught some three to four generations of historians. And I think I uh, should, I would belong either to the first generation of her students or the second generation. But Richa and Rakesh and others, they followed me. Today's theme is on the Indian nation in times of coronavirus. It's an extremely important theme. Nation is something that we are all deeply interested in. As students of history, we have an image of a nation when it's Indian nation when it started developing since the second half of the 19th century and matured in the first half of the 20th century during the course of the national movement. It was the imagination of inclusive territorial civic nation involving all the people living on this land. So it was truly inclusive and territorial and civic and non-coercive. No attempt was made during the course of the national movement to coerce anyone into a membership of the nation. Now, but you know, nations are not frozen entities. They don't remain the same. They are not immune. They change according to circumstances and all kinds of pressures. They are constantly vulnerable to pressures that are generated either from politics or from social structure or from economy. Therefore, the theme of Indian nation or the vision of Indian nation is an extremely important one in the kind of times that uh, we are going through. We are going through a huge global crisis. The global crisis will have uh, different manifestations for a society like ours uh, with our own peculiar problems, our own distinctive advantages and disadvantages. So what is this crisis uh, and uh, what are the kind of what is the kind of language what are the kind of perspectives that are at the moment available on this crisis which are likely to affect the trajectory of not just the trajectory of indian nation but also the vision of indian nation which in which direction it is going to go quite clearly the three perspectives or the three languages that i said one of is purely a medical perspective, the second is socio-economic perspective, and then there is also an epidemiological uh, perspective. Medical perspective, you know, is quite simple and perhaps the it has greatest clarity. The medical perspective says that do we should do whatever it takes to handle the medical problem, to solve the medical problem, irrespective of larger socio-economic consequences, larger realities, larger problems. What will it mean to the society? So those who have a medical perspective need not go into these kinds of questions. There is an immediate crisis. It's a medical crisis. It needs to be handled. So do whatever it takes to handle it. But there is also a socio-economic language or dimension or perspective on the crisis, which obviously is complex because it does not simply talk about the medical crisis, but also the socio-economic consequences, the cost, the social cost, the human cost, the economic cost, which is eventually borne by the people and poorer people. So I think in a socio-economic perspective, handling the crisis becomes a kind of a tightrope walk. If you tilt too much in one direction, there are risks and consequences. And there is also epidemiological uh, perspective or a language which basically says that in times like this, such epidemics must take a minimum of, the, of their toll. There is a minimum that cannot be avoided, but it can. we do not know what the maximum is. And the role of policies, efforts by state, by society is basically to minimize the gap 
between the minimum and the maximum. I'm sure there are other ways available, but all the three languages, the medical language and perspective, the socioeconomic perspective, and the epidemiological perspective, all of them do affect the trajectory of our nation, the vision of our nation, the imagination of our nation, and the nation, the Indian nation, which developed since the second half of the 19th century, which is very dear to us. And the direction that Indian society as a whole is going to take will depend to a very, very great deal on the kind of vision of the Indian okay. nation, which is going to be upheld and nurtured by the society as a whole. So I think with that, I will stop because we are, we are all looking forward to uh, listening to Professor Murdula Mukherjee on this extremely, extremely important theme in which he's going to bring together these two things, the vision of Indian nation and in current times, what are the ways in which the times and the crisis are going to affect our vision of the Indian nation and also uh, uh, vice versa. So with that, I think I'll hand over to the organizers who would uh, uh, invite uh, Professor Murdula Mukherjee for the special distinguished lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Chair uh, Professor Sareer Mishra, for highlighting so many issues. And now without wasting any time, I would uh, invite Dr. Simi Mehta, our CEO, to give a formal introduction of uh, Professor Murdula Mukherjee. Simi, please. Meanwhile, uh, Professor uh, Vidla ma'am can get ready, uh, yes, for the lecture. Thank you. Send me over to you, your mic. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mishra and uh, Dr. Arjun. Um, it is my honor to introduce to you Professor Mridula Mukherjee, who actually notes, needs no introduction because her work and her personality speaks for herself. But nevertheless, uh, I would try. Professor Mridula Mukherjee recently retired as a professor of modern Indian history at the Center for Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She has been the director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, president of the Indian History Congress of Modern India, dean of the School of Social Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and editor of selected works of Jawaharlal Nehru. She is the editor of the Sage series in modern Indian history, of which 14 monographs have already been published. She specializes in agrarian history, peasant movements, the Indian national movement, and Mahatma Gandhi. She has been a visiting scholar and fellow at several universities around the world. Some of these are Duke University, USA, University of Tokyo in Japan, uh, Nantes Institute of Advanced Study, France, Institute of Advanced Study at Lancaster, United Kingdom, Sao Paulo in Brazil, at La Sapienza, the University of Rome in Italy. She has also been the num a member of advisory board of the Long Room Hub at the Institute of Advanced Study at Trinity College, Dublin in Ireland. She has co-authored two best-selling books Called, the, called India's Struggle for Independence, published by Penguin in 1989. And in uh, 2008, she published India Since Independence. Both of these books have been translated into several languages. Her other publications are Peasants in India's Nonviolent Revolution, Practice and Theory by Sage Publications in 2004, and Colonializing Agriculture, The Myth of Punjab Exceptionalism, again published by Sage. She has been a regular and she continues to be a regular participant in talks and discussions on radio and TV. So uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us this evening and for accepting our invitation. With these few words, I invite Dr. Arjun Kumar to take it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simi, for the introduction. I don't think I have anything else to say uh, then to, I was eagerly waiting. We all are, were waiting for uh, for Ma'am's lecture. So, Ma'am, over to you. Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today, and I must begin by thanking uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, uh, who invited me to come and uh, give this lecture on this very important day. I'm also very happy that I have uh, 
many distinguished uh, friends here today with me. Uh, in these times when otherwise one faces a lot of isolation, it's good to see people at least and talk to them, even if it is at a distance. Uh, I'm very honored that Professor Guman is here. I'm very happy to see BP Singh there. Oh, a lot of old JNU uh, faces makes you feel at home. Dr. Arjun Kumar himself is from uh, the university. So I think uh, this, I feel very much at home in the surroundings that you have uh, created. Though I dare say I'm a little intimidated by the number of your discussants. <laughs> I hope I have enough to say <laughs> to give them something to uh, talk about. Uh, so with those words, uh, let me uh, begin, um, begin my uh, talk. Yeah. Uh, as we know, today is a very, very important day. Uh, it's 73 years since we gained independence from foreign rule. And independence, which was the result of hard battles fought by millions of our countrymen and countrywomen. We must never imagine that it was something that came easily. It was a non-violent battle primarily, but it was a very hard fought battle with many, many sacrifices. This battle, this epic struggle for freedom came about because there was a nationalist vision uh, that informed it, a grand vision for the future. And it was this vision which then inspired the millions of people who then joined this battle. Now here, what I first want to do is to talk about what this vision was. What were the contours of this vision? What were the important elements of this uh, vision? I will first summarize it very briefly and then take up some of its important uh, elements. Because uh, in the time that I have, it's not going to be possible for me to go into great detail on everything. But I will highlight those also, which I think are very relevant for us today. So to begin with, I would like to say that there were crucial elements in this nationalist vision, which was evolved right from the time of the early nationalists, Lada Vainaruji, Gokhale, and coming down right till the time of Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Subhash Bose, Congress socialists, communists, everybody contributed to this vision for freedom. And there was a consensus around this vision for freedom. What were some of its elements? The first and foremost element in this vision was the principle of anti-colonialism, that we would not accept foreign domination in any sphere of life. That was the most important moving idea, if you like, the prime mover of history, as Bipin Chandra calls it, uh, which attracted people, which was at the foundation of this great movement. So, Today also, it is very relevant to us how we hold our head high in this world where hegemons rule the roost. This anti-colonial element of that vision is still very, very relevant for us. Secondly, the vision was that we would have an independent economic development would be, which would be self-reliant. What the Prime Minister today, we are hearing from the rooftops, Atmanibhar. My only quarrel is it, it sounds sometimes as if it has been just discovered in the last few months. I'm sure people would know better and know that this goes back to the beginning of our freedom struggle. Right from Dada Bhai Noraji onwards, they said self-reliant economic development. In fact, the whole debate was on whether there should be foreign capital involved in it or not. And the consensus was, no, it must be on the base of indigenous capital. So we must at least remember our past and our legacy. Thirdly, and very, very important and very, very relevant today, we cannot emphasize it enough, was secularism. That was also one, I would say, one of the foundation blocks, one of the foundation stones of the nationalist vision. You cannot understand Indian nationalism without this crucial foundation stone of secularism. Again, right from Dadabai Naroji 
and uh, his generation, Pirosha Mehta, to Tilak, to Aurobindo, to Vivekanand, all the greats of our freedom struggle. And of course, Gandhiji, who gave his life for that principle. And of course, Nehru. And of course, the entire left wing. And of course, all the Gandhians. And of course, Sardar Patel. They all believed that Indian nationalism is squarely based on the principle of secularism. None of them differed on this question. I will discuss it at greater length later. The fourth important element of this vision was that of a faith in a democratic, republican, civil libertarian political system. I'm using all these words together to explain its flavor. Just saying democratic is not enough because even monarchical, constitutional monarchies have democracy. We have uh, Britain, we have still have Japan, we have many other countries in the world where they still have nominal monarchs. But in the Indian case, it was very clear it was going to be Republican. It was on the model of the French Revolution, the model of the Republic, and not on that of a constitutional monarchical system. And thirdly, we have also democracies, some are partial democracies, some are full democracies, where you have the democratic structures in place, you have representative institutions in place, but you do not have civil liberties. You do not have freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of press, freedom of association, all these civil liberties, freedom of movement, all these are essential elements of civil liberties. So democracy and Republican order and civil liberties, these three were combined in this broad vision, if you like, of a democratic order. And this again was, I would say, one of the building uh, blocks. Therefore, the, wor the words very often go together, a secular democratic nationalist India. You cannot actually separate these three. There is no Indian nationalism without democracy. There is no Indian nationalism without secularism. Fifth element that comes in again, and this is very, very important. And again, there is a consensus on this, right from the early nationalists down to the left, uh, the, the leftist forces, that the vision of the economic and social development of India would be an egalitarian one. And in this egalitarian vision, there were two components. One was the component of social equality. And the second was the, the vision of economic equality, or you could call it a pro-poor orientation. Both of these were part of what I'm calling the egalitarian vision. On this last one is the only one on which there was serious debate within the national movement. Once the left perspective, the socialist perspective came to the fore, you could say that many people talked about socialism. Jawaharlal Nehru himself was one of the main uh, propagandists for the idea of socialism in India, as were the Congress socialists and the, the communists. On this, there were differences. Should it be a capitalist economic order or should it be a socialist economic order? There were differences. And you could not say that one particular perspective held total sway. It was a contest, especially from the 1930s onwards. But on the other issues, there was total consensus, including on the principle of social equality. When it comes to issues of gender equality, when it came to issues of ending caste oppression, there is nobody within the freedom struggle who differed on those uh, issues. They were all on the same page. There may be differences about how to go about it. There is the <coughs> Gandhian method of fighting for social equality, and there could be other methods. Ambedkarite method, uh, today we could talk about it, of fighting for social equality. But on the principles, there was no difference. So I think I would like to uh, uh, go forward and take up some of these elements for greater uh, elaboration, uh, because I think it's very, very important that we understand how deep the commitment to these values was. As I said, I cannot possibly go in uh, depth with for all the principles, but what I would like to uh, talk about uh, more in terms of elaboration 
would be on the issue of secularism and on the issue of uh, civil liberties and democracy. And uh, again, because I think I want to uh, elaborate, I, I want to give you examples so that you are able to understand and get some flavor of the way in which the, the ideologues of our freedom struggle articulated uh, this uh, issue. I'll first uh, uh, take up uh, the issue of uh, secularism uh, for the very simple reason that I think as I will go forward, you will see why uh, in the second part of my talk. But I think we all will agree that it's today a very, very important issue before the Indian nation, before the Indian people, before the Indian society. Are we going to remain true to the ideals of our freedom struggle when it comes to secularism? Are we going to uphold the principles of secularism which are enshrined in our constitution? Or are we going to go a different way? I think that is a very, very important question facing us uh, today in our society. So I'd like to go back and uh, remind uh, the viewers about what it was, how was it formulated, how was it looked upon. And here, of course, the crucial question was that of how do you deal with the issue of minorities? And then the largest minority, uh, obviously, at that, that time uh, was uh, the, the Muslims. And I would like to take you back to 1942, because I find that just before the Quit India movement, when Gandhiji is giving the biggest call ever for a revolutionary struggle against the British. He is so concerned about the issue of what will be the vision, uh, what is the vision of India when it comes to the question of the minorities. In fact, I am surprised to find that in his famous speeches of 7th and 8th August in Bombay, just before the start of Quit India movement, uh, the amount of time that he devotes to the issue of what is this future India and especially the place of minorities within it and especially reaching out to the Muslims to convince them that they were very much uh, that there was no India without them. So I'd like to just quote to you uh, a few lines uh, from his writing writing and speech at the time. I'll, I will begin with uh, a quote from uh, draft instructions for civil resistors which were presented to the working committee on the 8th of august by mahatma gandhi they were to be adopted on the 9th of august but the entire congress leadership was arrested in the early hours of 9th of august so these could never actually be distributed to people or given to people but this shows you the intention the people this in these is the people of india are told what you have to do once the movement starts I will just quote to you a few lines from there. After the withdrawal of British rule, the constitution of the future government of the country will be settled by the joint deliberation of the whole nation, including all parties. The government will not belong to the Congress, nor to any particular group or party, but to the entire 35 crores of the people of India. All congressmen should make it clear that it will not be the rule of the Hindus or any particular community. It's so clear. It's the, the manner in which he articulates is so clear. In fact, in, in his public speech on the very same day that he presented this in the closed uh, meeting of the uh, working committee, Gandhiji in the public uh, speech, which was attended by thousands of people begins Again, talking to the Muslims, addressing the Muslims, he says, those Hindus who, like Dr. Munje and Sri Savarkar, believe in the doctrine of the sword, may like to keep the Muslims under Hindu domination. I do not represent that section. I represent the Congress. The Congress does not believe in the domination of any group or any community. It believes in democracy, which includes in its orbits Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Parsis, Jews every one of the communities inhabiting this uh, inhabiting this vast country he continues india is without doubt the homeland of the muslims inhabiting this country 
Every Musliman should therefore cooperate in the fight for India's freedom. The Congress does not belong to any one class or community. It is open to Muslims to take possession of the Congress. They can, if they like, swamp the Congress by their numbers and can steer it along the course which appeals to them. The Congress is fighting not on behalf of the Hindus, but on behalf of the whole nation, including the minorities. It would hurt me, he says, to hear of a single instance of a Muslim being killed by a congressman. In the coming revolution, congressmen will sacrifice their lives in order to protect the Muslim against a Hindu's attack and vice versa. It is part of their creed and it is one of the essentials of nonviolence. Just note the strength of his statements, the emotion in it, the, the, the power with which he is giving this uh, message, as I said, at the time when he is calling people for this uh, biggest uh, battle against the British, the last battle against the British. I will give you one more uh, example, since you're such an educated audience, I can indulge a little bit more with you. Uh, in, in the Harijan of 9th August, 1942, that is the very day the movement breaks out, the very day the leadership is picked up, Harijan comes out on that day. So he has obviously written it just before, maybe just a few days before that. He has written this uh, article. And he says in this, he refers to a complaint forwarded to him by the president of the Delhi Provincial Congress Committee, which says that the RSS, consisting of 3,000 members, goes through a daily Lathi drill, which is followed by reciting the slogan, Hindustan belongs to Hindus and to nobody else. This recital is followed by a brief discourse in which speakers say, drive out the English first and then we shall subjugate the Muslims. If they do not listen, then we shall know what to do with them. Gandhiji then comments that taking the evidence at its face value, the slogan is wrong and the central theme is worse. I hope those in charge of the Swam Sevak Sang will inquire into the complaint and take the necessary steps. And then he proceeds to counter this notion with, of this notion of Hindustan belongs to Hindus and nobody else with a classic formulation, a formulation which became a classic statement of true Indian nationalism and I quote it. The slogan that is of Hindustan belongs to Hindus is wrong and absurd for Hindustan belongs to all those who are born and bred here and who have no other country to look to. Mind you, this is the only definition of who can be an Indian. You're born and bred here and you have nowhere else to go. No CAA, no definitions based on this. You should be a refugee. You should be persecuted. You should be this. If we go back to Gandhi and make this the principle of our citizenship, anybody born and bred here and who says I don't have anywhere else to go. You don't need certificates. You don't need anything more. Therefore, he says, it belongs to Parsis, to Beni Israelis, to Indian Christians, to Muslims and other non-Hindus as much as to Hindus. Free India will be no Hindu Raj. It will be Indian Raj based not on the majority of any religious sect or community, but on the representatives of the whole people without distinction of religion. Religion is a personal matter which should have no place in politics. I think as far as the issue of secularism is concerned, we probably don't need to go beyond this. I think in Gandhiji's memorable words, I think it is crystal clear how beautifully he has articulated and given to the people this message. Please mind you, Though those days there was no TV and there were no uh, uh, social media to take your messages instantly to millions of people. But probably Gandhiji's me message even then reached more people than anybody's message reaches today. I would still throw a challenge uh, to, to disprove the statement that I'm making, you know. So when he speaks to the people, it is a message that is carried. It is not something that is his personal belief. He is giving this 
message to the people of India. And it is for this vision that they are fighting. It is for this vision that the very same day that I'm giving you the quotations, that the thousands and then hundreds of thousands came out into the streets in villages and towns and gave such a answer to the British government that after that they had to decide that they had no choice but to uh, leave India. I will now move to the other issue very briefly. Uh, the issue of uh, the vision being based on a democratic, civil libertarian, republican uh, principles. And I think here too, uh, I, would, uh, I would say that uh, uh, it's extremely uh, useful to just uh, look at the formulations that were made by our great leaders. And again, I can do nothing better than quote Gandhiji. I will quote to you a statement that Gandhiji makes. Uh, one second. Yes, I quote, liberty of speech means that it is unassailed even when the speech hurts. Liberty of the press can be said to be truly respected only when the press can comment on the severest terms upon and even misrepresent matters. Please note, freedom of press means press has the right to misrepresent matters. Why? Because who will decide when it is presenting properly or misrepresenting? The moment you give that power to the executive or even to the judiciary, as we are finding, it becomes a curb on the freedom of the press. Freedom of association is truly respected when assemblies of people can discuss even revolutionary projects. In another quote, he says, civil liberty consistent with the observation of nonviolence is the first step towards Swaraj. It is the breath of political and social life. It is the foundation of freedom. There is no room here for dilution or compromise. It is the water of life. You cannot live without it. It is like water is to life. Civil liberty is to Swaraj. So today when we are talking on the day we got our freedom, do we have that kind of freedom? Where our civil liberties are protected? Is the water of life that we need, the water we need, need to sustain this freedom? We need to ask ourselves these questions. In a similar way, Jawaharlal Nehru said, I quote, the freedom of the press does not consist in our permitting such things as we like to appear. Even a tyrant is agreeable to this kind of freedom. Civil liberty and freedom of the press consist in our permitting what we do not like, in our putting up with criticism of ourselves, in our allowing public expression of views which seem to us even to be injurious to our cause itself. So this is the kind of uh, articulation uh, that we had uh, on, on these uh, principles in the words of uh, 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 two of our greatest uh, freedom fighters. I would just like to elaborate on this a little bit uh, to just uh, tell you that it was not only that these were, uh, the, these were principles which uh, I'm just that these were principles which they talked about. These were principles on the basis of which the national movement actually uh, functioned. Important decisions within the Congress, for example, were taken on the basis of voting. Some, for example, the decision to start the non-cooperation movement in 1920, 1,886 people voted for it and 884 people voted against which was a resolution which was presented by Gandhiji. Similarly, when Gandhiji condemned uh, uh, the attack on the Viceroy's train uh, at the Lahore Congress in 1929, he brought forward a resolution, 794 people opposed his resolution and 942 people uh, supported it. So even within the national movement, the way the actual functioning was done uh, was in a manner that it encouraged uh, the, the practice of internal democracy. I would also like to say that it was not just civil liberties. It was not just the voting principle. They were, of course, committed to adult franchise and all that. You only have to look at the Karachi resolution. And in fact, 
the commitment to adult franchise goes back to 1895 when tilak had come out with the constitution of india bill so that commitment was total but i think the other important thing which is the importance of dissent of tolerating and even encouraging dissent that that is a part of democracy that is something very important and there i would like to give you just one example we all know that gandhi ji and subhash bose developed serious differences in 1939 on the issue of his second term as presidentship uh, as president of the indian national congress and it was a uh, struggle which was fought in the open ultimately it came to a point where bose had to resign and in fact he went and then formed the forward bloc within the congress he was even removed from the presidentship of the uh, provincial congress committee Uh, of of bengal and disciplinary action was taken against him but at the same time gandhi ji issues public statements where he says both sides must have the freedom to present their views those who are against the position of subhash bose those who are for the position of subhash bose must put their arguments out in the public domain and let people decide who is right and who is wrong he never said that bose must should not be given a chance to express his opinions or try to suppress even more important a few months later the world war breaks out second world war breaks out india as you know is made a party to the war without asking for the consent of the indian people the congress protests even though they support britain and the allies in the war against uh, hitler fascists and mussolini nevertheless they are opposed to the forcible inclusion of india in that war now the congress working committee immediately calls an urgent meeting in wardha where gandhi ji has now settled down as you know in sevagram one small village in the middle of nowhere but which became the capital of india because gandhi ji lived there so a working committee meeting was called over there this is after bose has been expelled from pcc presidentship after he has formed the forward bloc after he was virtually thrown out of the presidentship of the indian national congress but he is invited to that meeting of the working committee socialists are invited to the meeting of that working committee even though they are not members of the working committee why because it was a principle of the congress which it was teaching its masses teaching its followers that the nation is everybody <coughs> and all opinions have to be respected and there is no freedom without dissent so even those who dissent with you must hear them maybe they have something to say which actually is very valuable you will be the loser if you suppress dissent if you curb dissent if you don't let those who differ with you speak and this is what nehru was saying in the quote which i had just uh, read out to you that you have to uh, it freedom means those who disagree with you freedom means freedom to criticize the supreme court by those who want to criticize otherwise if you don't want to criticize you obviously agree with it you know so this is the way in which these principles were uh, articulated during the course of our freedom struggle i uh, i think for the uh, for the sake of uh, uh, time i will not elaborate on that i think these examples should be sufficient enough and if people want to ask questions later i will be more than happy to deal with it i would now like to come to the issue of what is the status of that vision uh, today when we look at it from the lens of a historian of course but when we look at it in the context of the situation today in the context of course of the pandemic uh, also what it has done but to uh, including that from the context of 2020 from the context of the present situation in which we are placed how do these things look to us today where have we gone which are those principles where we may have actually uh, gone forward where are those principles where we need uh, to worry about what kind of stock taking uh, can we do today because today is a day of celebration no doubt but it is also and must be a day of stock taking when we sit back and reflect on where we came from where we are today and where we are headed that's the kind of way in which independence day should be celebrated 
So I would like to take up a few issues. I would say that when it comes to the issue of economic uh, development and independent economic development, I think right from uh, the time of Jawaharlal uh, Nehru's prime ministership, the first phase, uh, aided by the brilliant leaders uh, that he had with him, Sadat Patel, J.B. Pant, uh, and a whole galaxy. I don't have time to go into the names now. But Molana Azad, who looked after education, Rajkumari Amritkar, who looked after health, you know, so many of them I can go on. I think the foundations of independent economic development were laid well and deep in the Nehruvian period. I think we cannot doubt that. Of course, there were still issues. Of course, poverty didn't go away. Of course, inequality was there. But I think if it comes to laying the foundations, and not only laying the foundations in terms of setting up industry, but even more laying the foundations in terms of setting up the IITs, in setting up the basic research institutes, all your space, nuclear, advanced research institutes, which today are bearing fruit. Uh, for uh, setting up all the independent uh, academies uh, of uh, various uh, kinds. And of course, setting up the public sector, which gave a big boost because there could be no independent economic development without a public sector, which went into <laughs> heavy industry where the Indian, uh, nascent Indian capital did not have the capacity at that time to go into. These were certainly strengthened uh, in the following years under Shastri and, and again under uh, uh, Indira Gandhi and right up till the 80s. I think in 91, when we went in for economic reforms, the understanding was that this policy, which has served us very well till now, needs some changes, what we call liberalization, because the world economy has changed. And though our aim remains self-reliant development, it has to be done differently. We have to now open up. It, we must also remember that while these reforms were being done, the other principle of the vision, which was the egalitarian principle or the pro-poor principle, was not abandoned, was not forgotten. Uh, it was, as Dr. Banmohan Singh uh, many times have said, that it was reforms with a human face or with a social, with a safety net. I think the Indian reforms, therefore, were very different uh, from the typical model of the Washington consensus uh, uh, reforms, which many other countries in the world, especially Africa, Latin America, the course they took. I won't dwell on it more, but just to put that on the table. I think also that uh, when, it, uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, anti-colonial uh, perspective, we have managed to have a fairly independent foreign policy for the better part of the last 73 years. However, I'm constrained to say that there have been assaults on it. There have been deviations from it. There have been weaknesses which have been shown. I don't want to go into the details and we could do much better we could hold ourselves up far more independently than where recent developments have been there, especially on the Chinese front, uh, et cetera. Many instances vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the US where I think we really haven't come up to the mark. But again, I don't want to go into too many details on that for shortage of time because there are other things I want to emphasize. And I'm sure other experts can do a much better job of that. I would like to uh, say that I would like to take up uh, basically uh, three issues. Uh, let me first take up uh, the issue of secularism. Where are we headed today? Again, I think for good or for bad, sometimes better, sometimes worse. <coughs> for the first 40 or 50 years after independence, we didn't do too badly. For 10 years, we did pretty well. Gandhiji's martyrdom, there was a catharsis. India was in a sense, saved from communal strife for the first decade. Then from about 1960, communal strife again began to surface. But it, it was a situation where it was not overtaking the system. But I think from the 80s, a new kind of phase started, especially once the Hindutva movement started to take on an extreme form in the form of religion in danger or the Ram Janma Bhumi uh, movement came to the force. Things started to go. Uh, in a different kind of uh, direction. And I would say that 
coming to today that this is here where I feel uh, uh, the biggest or among the biggest uh, dangers uh, that we have to look at today in terms of the vision for the nation. And I will just mention to you a few instances. I think the manner in which the Kashmir situation has been handled, you know, the manner in which on 5th of August, uh, the Kashmir situation was handled in a manner where the people of Kashmir were not taken along at all. The political representatives were not taken along uh, at all. I'm not going into the details again. But this has serious implications because Kashmir has been a very important element in our whole conception of Indian secularism. We have staked, in fact, our claim to secularism saying we have had voluntarily a Muslim majority province that joined us. And this is, the, this is the way a secular nation behaves. So I think we have brought upon ourselves serious question marks <laughs> on the issue of secularism in the manner in which we, are, uh, we have handled uh, the Kashmir issue. And the fact that we have not been able to restore even basic civil liberties, internet connection, more than a year has passed, has also affected, I think, this whole perspective in a very serious way. The manner in which we brought up the issue of the Citizenship Amendment Act and connected it to the possibility of an NRC, we all know what happened, I don't go into the details. Certainly, it was a direction away from a secular vision. Here, communal elements, majoritarian elements, majoritarian thinking was brought into the body politic. It was sought to be brought into the legal framework. The very definition of citizenship was sought to be done in a way that was different from what it is in the Indian constitution, where there is no bar on any religious affiliation when it comes to issues of citizenship. Again, I will not elaborate uh, on that uh, further. Thirdly, I think the Ram Mandir uh, issue, the manner in which it has been uh, handled, and uh, yes, there was a court judgment. One hoped that building on a court judgment, which was taken by the Indian people with a lot of, I would say, uh, including the minorities uh, who could have had a lot of problems with it. It was taken with a lot of equanimity and with a hope for the future, with the hope that the future would be based on the act that was passed and which was mentioned in that judgment, the 1991 act where that no further religious disputes over places of worship would ever be permitted. But I think what has happened since then, a kind of majoritarian gloating, if you like, and I think the association of the state and of members of the state at the highest level with the process of the building of the temple, which was completely unnecessary because the Supreme Court itself said it should be a trust. And a trust was set up and I think the trust should have been allowed to do its job without the representatives of the state coming in because it is that which goes against the secular principle. It is the open association of the state with any religion that is against the secular principle. It is not following religion. It is not believing in religion or going to a temple or visiting to a temple in your private capacity that goes against the principle of uh, uh, secularism. So I would say we need to think about where we might have been going astray. I think I would also like to mention, and since this is so recent, we had very unfortunate happenings in the northeast of Delhi in February uh, earlier this year. What is okay, these kind of riots, these kind of mass violence, we are familiar with, it has happened many times. But I think <laughs> What we need to point out is that the nature of this violence has been undergoing a change in the last, uh, you can say, in the last couple of decades. From what earlier used to be a kind of clash between communities, increasingly these are becoming one-sided affairs. They, be, they take on more the character of pogroms rather than that of riots. We also have the very worrisome, pros, uh, uh, worrisome picture of allegations that the forces of law and order collude with certain elements, 
with certain communities, maybe with the majority community. These are things which are very, very serious and we cannot afford to let these things happen if we want to preserve our secular order. During the pandemic itself, it was very disturbing how a certain incident which occurred in Delhi, in the Nizamuddin area, where a particular uh, religious gathering was held, how that was sought to be taken advantage of in a communalized fashion, how the attempt was to communalize it, to use it for political uh, purposes. We continue to use to get reports, which were special reports on certain communities. So the result was that for some time, we even had in the public people belonging to certain communities, including Tela Walas, Riksha Walas, Sabdi Walas, being targeted because they belong to a minority community, being attacked and people there being boycotted. What kind of India are we building in? This is not the kind of India Mahatma Gandhi visualized. This is not the kind of India where he says, if anybody attacks a Muslim, a congressman, and the Hindu should be the first one to go and protect them. When I think back of what our freedom fighters fought for, and I try to match it with what I read in the newspapers, I really wonder, are we, can we not see where we are going? And we do everything in the name of Mahatma Gandhi. We will clean India in the name of Mahatma Gandhi. Swachh Bharat. But, you know, I think it is very, very important that we do some rethinking when it comes to these, uh, these issues. We do some hard, critical look at ourselves. When it comes to the issue of civil liberties, I would say that the disturbing things have been the, the tendency to pick up uh, under very draconian laws such as the UAPA, uh, etc., cetera, uh, people who are either academics or activists or uh, civil society uh, activists, lawyers, beginning with the Bhime Koregaon uh, case, where people who had nothing to do with the Bhime Koregaon case and who were dubbed as urban uh, Naxals, a large number of them were picked up almost two years ago and they're still in jail. Among them are lawyers, among them are academics, among their 80 uh, year old poets, you know, I think this does not, this is not the kind of self-confidence a free nation should have at age 73. It cannot bear criticism from harmless, actually harmless people, you know, and equating them with Naxalites and treating them as if they are serious dangers, including suggestions being made that they were in a conspiracy to actually assassinate the person who's holding the highest office. These are not the kind of people who do conspiracies. Even a child will know that. And then in more recent times, the kind of things we've had where students from universities, from uh, JNU, from uh, Jamia, Aligarh, how they have been picked up by the police, put in jail, uh, questioned by incidents of violence against the students are not taken into account the way JNU was uh, uh, completely brutalized. I was there that evening when it happened. I saw it with my own eyes. The way Jamia was treated, the way Aligarh was treated, that is not taken into account. But those who were protesting are the ones who are targeted and made further targets of uh, attack and uh, uh, interrogation. Obviously, this is not civil liberties, this is not democracy, this doesn't resemble anything like that. People like Harsh Mandar, people like Apurvanand, Professor Apurvanand has been called in for questioning. And now Prashant Bhushan has been uh, held guilty of contempt of court. A person who has been fighting on issues of human rights, fighting for the poor, the deprived, fighting without payment, you know, for a whole range of causes, a whole range of movements. He has been an unofficial uh, lawyer spokesperson, if you like, for a range of all Gandhian causes, all nonviolent movements, like right to information, right to education, child rights. You have such a cause and you go to Prashant Bhushan and he takes it up. And such a person is now being punished. Even if you think he made a mistake, you could have reprimanded him and uh, let him go. Where is the need? What message are we sending to our people, to our youth? 
And here, uh, again, the media, you know, I think what's happening in the media is also something that is extremely uh, worrying. You people know about it more than I do, but it's a made to order media. The number of spaces in the media, the number of channels, the number of newspapers, which are really independent, which freely speak their mind has been diminishing. And there is too much of uh, agreeing with the powers that be culture in our media. That is not the role of the media. The media is meant to be the fourth estate, which is meant to always hold a mirror up to the powers that be. Just as you have the division between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary for a healthy democracy, the media is also one more organ that is supposed to play that critical role, holding up a mirror to us as to where we are going wrong and not being a, a somebody who claps when uh, we do our uh, whatever uh, we are doing. And here I would say that I am so distressed that uh, you know, the movement which actually started in, in December last year against the CAA was to my mind a unique movement in post-independent India. In fact, I cannot think of a movement which resembles the vision of a uh, nationalist vision of India more than this movement. Almost every principle of that vision that I have talked about was present in this movement. It was non-violent. They used to carry portraits of Gandhiji and Ambedkar. It was for the constitution. For the first time, the constitution was brought to the streets and people sat in the streets and read the constitution. In their drawing room, people read the preamble. Our youth got to know the preamble for the first time. If this movement had done only that, we should have given it an award, a Bharat Ratna, for having taken our basic principles of our nation to our people. What we haven't been able to do in 73 years, this youth movement did, and it was a movement of youth. It was not a movement of one community. It was a movement of youth, primarily students from all over the country, from all over the country. It was a movement of women, it was across class, it was across religion. That was the vision of the Indian freedom struggle. Mahatma Gandhi, I'm sure could not have imagined, could not imagine a movement that took forward his ideals uh, more. It was fighting for civil liberties. It was fighting for principles, secular principles of citizenship. And we crushed this movement, taking advantage of the pandemic. So coming back to the pandemic, within the context of the pandemic, I think one of the tragedies of the pandemic has been the way one of India's most unique post-independence mass movements, I will call it a mass movement, has been suppressed. And that is really tragic because it was going in the right direction, picking up the right issues. And again, what is so sad is that now a whole narrative is being built that this movement, in fact, or people from this movement were in fact conspiring to indulge in violence and that the riots that happened in Delhi in the last part of February 2020 were a result of a conspiracy by people who were active in this movement. What could be a greater travesty? Harsh Mandar, do you know his work? Do you, do, I think, you know, he, Apoorvanand, I mean, these are all people who believe in nonviolence, who believe in democracy, who believe in civil liberties. You read their writings, you hear their speeches, you see their works. The, the, all the organizers which Harsh Mandar has set up, Karva and Mohabbat, some activists even laugh at him that he goes around, he looks like Gandhi and he goes around, tries to become a Gandhi and even talks about nonviolence where it is not relevant. But, and here is a person you are, you are trying to say he's linked to a conspiracy to indulge in violence against uh, a section of our society. So I think somewhere some very painful uh, things have uh, happened and we really need to uh, as a society, together, not in a, not in a, in a, in a partisan manner. I think the time has come to bridge those. We need to talk the language of love. We need to talk the language of uh, comradeship. It's not a question only of blaming one or the other. We all need to look 
insights. We don't look at ourselves, where we have gone wrong, where we might have failed. And here I would then like to come to my last point, which is about the pro-poor aspect of the nationalist vision, the egalitarian aspect of the nationalist uh, vision, and how I think that has been violated in the last few months, in particularly in the context of the lockdown coming out of the uh, pandemic situation. Of course, I would also say that I think that for the last few years, even in our economic vision, more elitism has come in. We have in fact, though today we are talking of Atmanirbhar, but we have been in fact surrendering, if I might say, to big corporations and to foreign capital in practice. You know. But anyway, I'm not an expert on that, so I don't want to dwell too much on that. But certainly it is unforgivable the way in which we managed or mismanaged the pandemic the lockdown and then even when we saw the consequences when we saw on our tv screens and our phone screens and we could not ignore it anymore when we saw the poor of our country in their thousands and hundreds of thousands starving crying walking in the heat their children being dragged along them dying uh, in the transport on the way what did we do how long it took us to move, to lift our little fingers. We were quite happy sitting inside our official Lutian's Delhi offices. Though our present establishment is always calling other Lutian's Delhi people, but they are the ones sitting inside these Lutian Delhi offices and not be even reacting to what's going on outside. How could we do it? And who were the people who came out and fed the poor? The same Harshmanders. The same civil society people, the same Hindu Prakash Singh, who I see on my screen, who have been working on the with street children now for years, who have sat nights out in the cold, looking after the poor and the desperate, exactly in the Gandhian spirit. If I now pick up an Hindu Prakash Singh and put him in jail or interrogate him, what India is there left? Certainly not any India that Gandhi ever thought about. So here. I mean, I don't have to talk about it more because you all know what I'm talking about. You know, even today when all the economists in the world, within the country, everybody with any, what shall I say, any wisdom is saying we need to spend more. We need to do cash handouts. We need to distribute food. We need to do what we can to increase the demand in the society, even if it is for the sake of industry, we need to increase demand. We need to put money in the hands of people. We need to put resources in the hands of people. We are still discussing our you know, fiscal deficit and how we should manage it. The world is doing it. The European Union is spending something like, I forget the figure, some 780 billion <coughs> for the pandemic to deal with the economic situation extra. In the United States, the debate between whether they should give extra 400 or $600 in addition to the unemployment allowance to people who've lost their jobs. Here we give our women 500 rupees. 10% of GDP. 10% yes, of American right. GDP. Ten, exactly. And here we are arguing, we are not ashamed to offer the women of India 500 rupees. It probably costs them more to come to the bank to take it because they have to come from their villages over there and stand in the line and hopefully eat something though in the day as well. Bring their children along, lose their wages. I'm ashamed when I even look at that figure of 500, when we know that our children will laugh if we give them today 500 to go, say 500, go and take it and go and spend out in a restaurant to eat, they will laugh at us and say, which which uh, days are you living in, mother or father or grandmother? You know? And here we are, we are insulting our poor when we treat them so in such a cavalier fashion that they don't deserve better. We cannot increase the wages of Manrega. The one print, the one program which is helping our poor today is Manrega. Why can't we just give, give, give her, give her this? Think that as many resources as are being made can be made available will be given. As much demand is there, we will give and raise the wages. It will help raise the minimum wages also. There, are, I'm not an economist, but I do read the newspapers. 
even I as a lay person can pick up so many ideas about what we could do. But this is the tragedy. Uh, I think we have lost ma'am due to connection. Uh, very pertinent uh, points by ma'am. Uh, uh, now I would invite Professor Salil Mishra to reflect upon ma'am's lecture. I'll try to connect with uh, her. I, yeah, yes, yeah I'm okay. I, can you see me again now? Yes, yes. It, it's perfect. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Connection just went off. Oh, that happens, yes. Maybe, maybe, maybe they didn't like what I was saying. Yes, ma'am. Uh, things happen. Please continue. Yes. No, I would actually, I have finished what I had to say. I've gone on for too long. I beg your indulgence. And uh, I would uh, like to conclude over here and thank uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar and all of you who are here for this uh, opportunity for me to share uh, not just uh, what I know, but also what I feel uh, on this day to day. I'm, I'm very grateful to you for this uh, opportunity that you have given me to share all that's been heavy on my heart for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your uh, very pertinent talk. We all were waiting to hear from you on this very auspicious day. And uh, as Goman sir rightly added, 10% of the GDP, the uh, US has sanctioned more than $3 trillion. You know, our GDP is not even that. Now, this week, they are moving towards $4 trillion. You know, that is 50% more than what our GDP is. That is the kind of transfer they have been able to give during this lockdown. So ma'am has raised uh, yes. very pertinent points, yes, uh, especially starting from the five visions of our freedom struggle, starting from principle of anti-domination, uh, uh, you know, sovereignty, and then independent economic uh, development, Atmirbhar ma'am also touched upon, and then ma'am ma uh, specifically focused more upon uh, non-violent secularism, and democratic civil liberties, uh, republic, and, and, and most importantly, in this modern 21st century India, uh, the very important aspect of economic and social equality. And uh, ma'am has touched uh, many, many faces, uh, uh, many things ma'am has uh, touched upon, also highlighted how the freedom struggle and how the making of India between Nehru, Gandhi, and so many freedom fighters uh, has been. One very pertinent point which ma'am raised that uh, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, our earlier Prime Minister, have said that the economic reforms in India has a human face. So that is one very pertinent point which, you know, from contemporary uh, history we have added here. Uh, we have, uh, and what are the message we are giving uh, youth? And uh, I think uh, the, the main message, ma'am, is also trying to portray is that we need to talk the, in the language of love and care, especially many parts ma'am has added. And uh, uh, without any uh, further time, I would now invite our chair, Professor Salil Mishra, to reflect upon the lectures. And then we can uh, quickly go for quick comments from many discussions we have across the breadth and length of our country. Sir, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, you would all agree with me that we've, uh, we've had a, a wonderful uh, lecture from Professor Mukherjee, who was able to cover uh, many dimensions. I don't think it needs, uh, uh, the lecture was obviously so explicitly argued that it does not really, uh, it, nobody needs to unravel its mysteries because it was argued so well. But basically, I think the two or three points uh, that were made by Professor Mukherjee, first of course, was that a vision of Indian nationalism, a contour outline of Indian nationalism began developing since the late 19th century and well into the 20th century during the course of the national movement. That was our Indian nationalism. And I think there were five major features of that Indian nationalism, which were almost like the DNA of Indian nationalism. You cannot imagine Indian nation without them, the way it developed. That was the, those were the building blocks of Indian nation anti-imperialism, 
independent economic development, economic sovereignty, secularism, which was almost a foundation stone of Indian nationalism, democratic, republican, uh, civil libertarian political structure, and egalitarianism, or broadly a pro-poor orientation. This, this was the DNA of Indian nationalism. After India became independent, I think the first few decades the story was all right there was there was there were problems here and there it, uh, the blueprint obviously blueprints cannot really be operationalized with the help of willpower there are all kinds of constraints but still all in all you could see that the hope was kept alive till the 80s the nation was doing well in the light of the framework that had developed during the course of the national movement it was since the 80s that you can see a slide down that you can see very serious damages happening to that vision of Indian nationalism. And I think Murtala Mukherjee highlighted three such great damages or basically elements which are destroying the spirit of Indian nationalism. First, of course, was secularism since the 1980s, the violence against Muslims, a kind of communalization of society, a certain majoritarianism taking over, communalism entering state structures, bureaucracy, civil society, our education being affected by that. So I think a great damage, whole edifice of secularism <coughs> began to be damaged. Second, of course, was civil liberties, how important civil liberty was to Indian national, to the vision of Indian nationalism, to our leaders like Gandhi and Nehru, and how suddenly uh, that vision of civil liberties is also under a great threat, under a great assault. And third, of course, was the pro-poor uh, uh, element, the pro-poor dimension of the Indian national movement. And I think that also, there is a kind of an element that the pro-poor dimension has also gone down. And we can see many examples of that, particularly during the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, the crisis. So in a way, what she was saying is that the coronavirus has brought out, has highlighted this great crisis, has highlighted to us the problems that had started developing with our Indian nationalism, uh, India, our vision of Indian nationalism. Problems in the field of secularism, problems in the field of civil li uh, liberties, and problems in the field of a pro-poor orientation. And all those have now come up to the surface in times of the crisis. So these are obviously worrying times. We need to go back to the drawing board. We need to think a lot. We need to think what are the ways in which this blueprint needs to be protected. There is no problem with the blueprint. Blueprint does not need to be revisited. It needs to be developed. It needs to develop. That, of course, it has to. But there is a robust blueprint of Indian nationalism. But serious damages have occurred to it. Uh, and we need to go back to the drawing board. We need to chalk out strategies. We need to think about it. But we do recognize that at least in the field of secularism, civil liberties, and a pro poor element, very serious damages have occurred to Indian nationalism, to the vision of Indian nationalism since the 1980s. And the current crisis has exemplified some of them in a very stark, very naked, very brutal kind of a manner. Time for us to think, time for us to reflect. Well, I'll stop here because there is a, there, are, there are a number of discussants who are going to be now making their contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Selin Mishra and also for chairing this session and your kind remarks. With your permission, I will now go to, uh, to the discussion. And uh, also uh, the, the point as, as rightly point put out by you, uh, there has been also, you know, contraction on many areas. I also discussed with ma'am. Uh, countries are also becoming, you know, protectionist. So also from economic sphere, many other things are also developing. That is why I just wanted, you know, to, to highlight because uh, our, uh, the, former Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, the whole era which uh, the people like me, the young people, we have we have lived this this era of liberalization and, and di also diversity and, you know, modern modern India. So we, in our discussions, we have uh, people not just from history, but from different spheres of, of uh, ed education, life, uh, bureaucrats also, also from elected representative and, you know, professor from different departments. Uh, and uh, also social activists like uh, Dr. Indu Prakash Singh here to share with us and on this very auspicious day. So uh, 
without wasting any time i would like to now invite our uh, first panelist for the day uh, professor rakesh patabial uh, professor rakesh patabial is uh, associate professor at center for media studies at uh, at uh, jawaharlal nehru university sir over to you yes sir your mic hmm. can you hear me yes yes it's, it's... yeah professor mukherjee uh, as professor mishra has talked about is our teacher and she had given us whenever we started our educational journey in this university this vision which after 30 years within our own educational experience education life we see being throttled so she has given an entire panorama and i take a cue from her um, lecture and just spend 2 3 minutes as to what i would from that uh, weave into the way i look at it uh, in this moment of covid pandemic now any any global phenomena including the economic uh, globalization that began in the 90s for this country Uh, similarly uh, world wars were global phenomena it became global phenomena and similarly in 1896 the spanish influenza for example 1920s there was a plague which was also had a global dimension so what all these global events with global dimension does is to present a crisis and as salil uh, professor mishra has elaborated one point that uh, and what uh, mr uh, mukherjee had talked about is that the pandemic and since in your title you are talking about it as an era so what this 4 5 months of an era or a year of an era does is uh, historically they have done and it is doing is to present the crisis and it brings certain phenomena which was happening which was engineered which was natural everything happening and bring them to a relief the kind of sharpness so what uh, mr mukherjee was talking about is the sharpness of those things which has reached us now and we are seeing the stare i was sitting in a meeting couple of days back in a zoom meeting when one of our faculty was newly appointed uh, completely all fraudulent practices through all fraudulent practices and i was thinking that 10 years back the same candidate would have been come from another party backing so what we are doing is actually killing at some of the basic morals of the society in that sense the pandemic and the regime that is now handling the pan pandemic has actually got a lot of sustaining uh, traits from the processes that were happening and i will just take one big process in which they have capitalized is that the country as a as a as a as a as a intellectual realm country as a as some uh, people and as uh, vipin chandra talked about indians as people i don't know and uh, so mukherji was mentioning that so as a people we have somewhere let it allow to happen and that is when we as you talked about economy being contracted we as people became we are becoming contract we are contracting our own vision and there i'd make this point slightly elaborately so that it covers all the discussion discussion point that professor mukherjee had talked about secularism economic well being no egalitarian now all these ideas also operate in in a concrete reality in historical reality and when we talked about the evolution of indian uh, the vision of indian nation before 1947 we did not have pakistan we had a natural frontier going beyond pakistan to afghanistan to middle east to egypt to europe and mind you nehru was attending the anti colonialist meeting in brussels in 1927 we were sending delegation to china now today who are india's natural allies as our prime minister uh, talks from the rooftop israel you name all the authoritarian regimes or the worst kind of regimes and they are our natural allies as we have discussed so therefore what had happened over the last 5 6 years is not just contraction of economy 
but contraction of Indian as people. They are now seen across the world, including the NRIs, who themselves are part of extremely, extremely contracted uh, groups. We are now no longer part of larger just battles of justice. We are not seen by Palestinians as their natural allies. We are not seen, we are not as a state, as people not seen in the entire episode of Middle East where millions of peoples are displaced, attacked, killed, bane. We are not seen with them. Neither do we see ourselves to be with them. So the tragedy is that we are not there, but in our minds, we are not there. So we are becoming a narrow and narrow and narrow. And, and therefore, this pandemic was an opportunity, is an opportunity to open our door, as Tagore would say, khol darja khol. Please open your door and see the world, because only a narrow people can be a hateful people, can be envious people, can be a jealous people. And these are the virtues that are regularly through Twitter, through Facebook, through WhatsApp are being propagated. Indian na nation, as Dr. Mukherjee was elaborating, was a, was a jubilant, was a celebrity, celebrating, was a vision of a large world, larger humanity. We were part of everything that was happening in the world. And this was carried on by leaders, intellectuals, and everyone. What happened in the last 20, 30 years that instead of becoming bigger in terms of our mind, in terms of our society, we, become, we became bigger, bigger only through bringing some personalities, bringing some big UN officer as our foreign minister. That doesn't make us big. We have to be, we, our, many of our education ministers were traditionally literate. Abul Kalam Ajad was a traditionally literate. He didn't go to Harvard or Princeton or anywhere. He went to Al Azhar. He, he, was a, he was a scholar of Arabic and he gave us the best of institution, best of institution, best of universities, Asahit Kala Academy, Lalit Kala Academy. It was Abul Kalam Ajad. So therefore we were big people. Our leaders were big and we were illiterate. We are poor, but we thought big way. We wanted to be excellent. Now, these are the vision part of the vision through those kind of uh, effort that we wanted to be big, we created big things. Now we are becoming a big economy, but very poor people, very li limited kind of people. So therefore, what we have done is to, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, last five years, particularly after the new regime had come, they have sapped us from all those, even the connections were becoming, Weaker, they have sacked us further. They have narrowed us so, so, so close, so narrow that we are not even seen beyond our borders. Bagha, Bagha becomes our mental border, not just a physical border with Pakistan. We don't see that our natural geography is our West historically. Even the best of engineers came from Syria and Iraq and Damascus to make make our uh, or Central Asia to make our Taj Mahals. Today, we don't give, get an IIT engineer to make our university quarters. Imagine. So we were net gainers from the whole of West Asia, which was our, our natural frontier. We are isolated. We are bound. We are isolated from all sides. So as we are politically, geographically getting isolated, we are becoming narrow and narrow and narrow people. And narrow people don't make big vision. And that is where I thought pandemic was an opportunity, is an opportunity where we can think about the world, what is happening in the world. As somebody was talking about, Professor Kuman was talking about the percentage of GDP that was devoted. So people are, because the media has more or less killed in many ways, many of our initiatives, but at least this can be done that we make the people and national, Indian nation, Indian national movement and the vision of national movement of Indian nation was that it would be a vibrant, it would be a vibrant democracy. It would be a vibrant society where all kinds of people would have existence, not only existence, they will survive. And not only they will survive, they will survive beautifully through excellent institutions. And excellent institutions are made by excellent people. So what has happened in the last five years, last five months, is that we have become, we have forgotten all these ideas in the sense that we thought that we are killing one kind of nationalism by bringing another kind of very sectarian, extremely narrow, which needs always, which needs an enemy to define itself 
it is like what I, I quoted yesterday that uh, somebody said, why don't they make an another university to create an excellent university in some of their leaders name? I said, no, they are coils. They need already established institution to change them. So therefore, what today is, is, a, is a day where as Professor Mukherjee has so beautifully elaborated the entire range of issues that were part of uh, national movement's vision of India, Today, we have this opportunity to relink ourselves with people across the world who are struggling because only when we, when we, part, we are part of somebody's life, we know what their, that life is all about. Therefore, uh, uh, this is an opportunity that we should be, uh, uh, we should be making our, the, the national vision that we had uh, as much more richer much more uh, richer in the sense of our experience over the 70 years. Also, we inherit that since we in inherit that vision that gives us a strength to relook, relink ourselves to the people at large across the world. And only when we do that, our own people will have their larger horizon returned to them. Thank you. I didn't want to elaborate much, but I thought this is in, uh, the point that I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, reflecting these points. Uh... Uh, uh, professor, uh, uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> trying to cover all, all these aspects. Thank you for joining, despite your uh, busy schedule. We are so glad that uh, you came here and share your thoughts. Without wasting any time and further ado, I would like to invite Professor uh, Ranjit Singh Bhuman. Uh, sir is joining us from Chandigarh. Sir is a professor at Center for Research in Rural and Industrial Development, Great Chandigarh. It's a it's a it's a very uh, known institution, especially in our northwest India. And sir is leading those area for like decades for economic and social development. Sir, over to you. Uh, thank you. And uh, without wasting much of my time, let me say one sentence before that, that it's always a treat to listen to Professor Murindala. And today, again, it, he has added to that treat. One. Second is, very hurriedly, I would like to focus on one thing. Bipan Chandra's and Mirdra's and others' book, India's Struggle for Independence. Chapter 31 to 33 are very, very important and very relevant in the times to come and in the contemporary India. Let Don't wasting time, three pages of communalism, I would directly go to the last phase, third phase. It is based on fear and hatred and had a tendency to use violence of language, deed or behavior the language of war and enmity against political opponents. This is exactly what is happening now. And this is what some part of it exact happened during emergency. But at during emergency, one thing different was that it was not communal against the, uh, any uh, commu community, it was against the political opponents. But now it's both against the political opponents as well as the other communities. Particularly, I would say the minorities which constitute about 25% of the Indian population. And as a, as a student of economics, I must say that keeping 25% of the minorities unsettled, under fear, under threat, we cannot have peace and peace is prerequisite to development. So we cannot have development and the kind of India we want to build. And third point which I would like to make is that as a matter of fact, I'm not a student of history, but let me say that since independence, India was never free from communalism, but the Indian state was not communal. This is the difference. Indian state was not communal. Indian state was trying to be having no religion. But the kind of happenings, particularly epitome has reached, Prime Minister goes to lay the foundation of the mandar. I think this is unparalleled in the history of India. And it has changed the entire ethos. Probably Murdala has pointed to it that state functionaries should not have gone there. So it is no uh, that long, it is not in the interest of long-term unity and diversity, which is the strength of India. If
sir your mic is mute okay okay uh -huh. okay uh, it's yes. earlier was uh, it was on yes yes sir it's okay. fine okay okay so let me say that it is what is being done now is dismantling what went before and what we see in the five pillars which uh, uh, professor murdala has uh, uh, pointed out those pillars are also being dismantled and space for dissent and difference of opinion is shrinking day in and day out and in fact it is dismantling what we have positive and i don't know whether the substitute will be positive or not uh, uh, time will uh, tell but one thing is there that uh, the kind of uh, uh, constitution we the, the preamble we the people of india wants liberty justice and all that uh, which we uh, must bring in they they are the issues which uh, needs to be re-strengthened and re-emphasized otherwise uh, we will not be having any that of india which uh, our leaders visualized at the time of independence post independence and till even 80s so let me say that this corporatization of the state earlier it was uh, I, i would say crony capitalism now it's corporatization of the state and when you take si when when she was referring to delhi riot uh, in february it was again a one sided phenomena and we should focus on it that uh, this is not going to take india uh, for, uh, very far so if i won't take much of the time but i would uh, congratulate dr arjun and uh, his whole team that uh, at this point of time he has uh, come up with a very 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 uh, important thing but let me say one thing to conclude that it took uh, 16 years for pakistan to come muslim league is founded in 1906 and till 1930 there was no reference of pakistan but the idea was raised first by muhammad iqbal the poet politician and later by the uh, muslim league and some students uh, in cambridge and all that and if it goes like this the kind of uh, india we are building is not going to support unity in diversity or diversity in unity thank you thank you thank you so much professor guman for highlighting the university in diversity point and coming coming in in a very short notice uh, may many of the discussion and also highlighting this very pertinent point on corporatization of state uh, as well as the values of liberty and free enterprise uh, also in economic sphere uh, what is happening so large masses are not getting getting those you know the, those opportunities uh, next uh, for our this uh, panel discussion uh, shri bp singh secretary all india congress committee ex vice chairman nehru yuva kendra sansthan uh, uh, ministry of youth affairs and sports uh, sir has also been uh, very much you know active uh, in in jnu with uh, all all the activities uh, but i cannot see him here he is there on with me on whatsapp uh, he was there some issues on the on the zoom platform uh, we will come back again uh to to him i cannot we will come back next we have a very distinguished guest with us uh, i tried to had a different perspective on on ma'am's lecture and uh, as as guman sir also rightly pointed out that the books written by ma'am uh, we have read that as as history textbook in our schools and and, and everywhere so for having a, for we had a elected leaders and politician point of view also to the lecture Uh, but for now we have a bureaucrat's point of view practitioner's point of view and for that uh, dr rashmi singh ias and uh, currently additional commissioner at north delhi municipal corporation ma'am was also earlier secretary of new delhi municipal council and so on in the interest of time i would quickly go to dr rashmi singh to reflect upon uh, ma'am's lecture on the vision of indian nation ma'am over to you so thank you arjun so i'm glad that you have set the context uh, you know by saying that 
there were many discussions who we invited at the last minute so i'm probably one of them but uh, you know the fact is that uh, the day to day is the time to reflect by all of us so the fact is that you've given us an opportunity you know to reflect about uh, you know the vision in perspective of uh, the keynote address which was which has laid down you know so many challenges and um, even though i could not get you know the large part of the lecture because uh, you know i could join in late i could get towards the you know end the essence of it and uh, you know i could uh, you know get the import of the kind of challenges that we're looking at and uh, i i do feel that uh, you know it's uh, very important today that uh, you know we we look at challenges from the various perspectives and uh, you know from across the cross sections of different people you know the women the children the youth groups so you know within that cross section when i look at a life cycle kind of an approach so the aspirations in that life cycle you know are by and large common you know by and large when i look at the youth their aspirations would be common the children's aspiration would be common you know they will not really understand caste and creed and region every child would like to have a place to play you know every child would want education to be imparted in a manner in which you know he or she can understand comprehend things so it's time that we understand these aspirations every youth you know needs to get a decent you know opportunity to be able to make a decent living you know for himself or the family so to say similarly every woman her aspiration in terms of having you know the first thing is identity then the dignity you know again opportunities equal opportunities so i think today the big need you know for all of us in terms of aspiration is to have you know the access to equal opportunities for all you know while there may be differential experience but at least in terms of creating a level playing field it is important that the kind of like your divides that we see today you know between the rural urban you know so uh, between the socio economic strata so every child has the right to have a good education everybody has a right to have a good health care facility so those divides in my view today you know have it's time that we address those hardcore governance issues and uh, you know which are outcome based very concrete outcome based and uh, you know the aspirations have to be kind of reflected by our intent to be able to fulfill you know targets in terms of quantitative and qualitative milestones that that cannot possibly be done by the government alone i also feel i you know i work for the government but i know that the civil society also has a very important role you know just now i was in deliberation with a movement called tisri sarkar where we were talking about the role of the local bodies now in local bodies the urban local bodies the panchayat the gram sabha you know who is actually making the gram sabha you know people themselves are making the gram sabha but how many times do they really participate in it we find that many of the agenda it will just get passed by you know kind of proxy participation so it's time that people have to start getting engaged in the whole process you know in a much more active manner which affects their daily lives you know daily lives in terms of uh, you know, the 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 decision which which the the government institutions will make across like different layers you know be it at the level of panchayat or uh, you know elected municipal body or uh, your like local mla making a decision or a member of parliament making a decision so that it has to reflect people's voice but for that it is very important that every aspiration is not just aspirational theoretically but it gets practically translated into communicating the same it has to be communicated you see there was a time when women's uh, 
well, security was not so much of an issue to be talked about. You know, it was a time when, like, yeah, you know, many women will suffer in silence, you know, be a victim of domestic violence at home, but not talk about. So I, I feel that now it is the time to, you know, set the development discourse in terms of, you know, certain uh, practical nuances of life which affect us, but we have been like, you know, kind of treating it as a part of life. You know, why I said like women's issues is because I have worked a lot on these issues, even during my stint with the Ministry of Women and Child. So I've seen the kind of indicators that we have, you know, data reflecting that while 54% of the women, you know, saying it's okay, we've been used to it because it's a cultural notion to remain silent about it. So, you know, let's start questioning these. And of course, like, you know, livelihood and, you know, something which affects everybody. So when I talk about opportunity, you know, so let's start looking at all these critical development issues, you know, be it our IMR, infant mortality rate, our maternal mortality rate, our child sex ratio, our, uh, you know, the, the, the school enrollment rate, you know, the retention rate, you know, at the senior secondary level. So all these brass track issues will tomorrow make our governance also more accountable for people like me working within the government. If I know that I'm being asked these questions, you know, I know that whatever I say about the fact that I'm working very hard, you know, and if I'm made more accountable, you know, by like somebody questioning my actions, that how does it really translate into outcomes? So, you know, that's a reality of our time that more people are aware more people are educated, you know, the more people start engaging themselves, you know, by making governance accountable, you know, the better would be uh, the kind of, um, I would say the, the delivery and uh, the, the robustness of the institutions. Because today we are, you know, all talking also about the resilience of our institutions, right? I mean, whether, whether they have the space, you know, so the resilience of our institutions, in my view, also has to start looking at all the institutions, you know, starting from even our family as an institution, the school as an institution, the Gram Sabha, the Ward Samiti, you know, so all these institutions, so they all have to be made accountable. Then only like, you know, we look at the entire, you know, kind of, uh, it has a, the cascading effect does not really have to just be top down, you know, it can, there can be a bottom up approach, you know, so it's a reverse model you know, where we set agenda right from the grassroots. So that's all I had to say about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rashmi Singh, for highlighting the uh, participatory uh, aspirations and uh, universal social security aspect and outcome-based uh, and institution, many, many, many uh, dimensions. Uh, uh, Samir Unhale, sir, uh, IAS and also Joint Commissioner of Municipal Administration in Maharashtra State. Uh, was also with us. He just uh, uh, left a few moments ago, but he has left us uh, with a question to ma'am, uh, directed to ma'am. Um, not Yes. And sir is asking that the Spanish flu in India from 1918 to 1920 was very bad. Uh, and some claims that in India, the death due to this pandemic was to the tune of 10% of the population, around 2.5 crores. Uh, that's almost, yes, 10% of the population. Uh, so, so much of the British benevolent rule of its colony, surprisingly, nothing is found in the popular mainstream history books or records. So what from history we can learn during this pandemic? Uh, this is a very pertinent point uh, Sir is raising uh, to, to ma'am, as, as you know, a practitioner's point of view. Uh, BP Sir was again trying to connect. I'll just check again. No, he came again. Some... We'll try to. Okay, okay. So, uh, without wasting much time, we'll quickly go to Aligarh so, uh, with our uh, JNU senior uh, Murad sir. Uh, Dr. Murad Ahmad Khan is assistant professor at Department of Foreign Languages, Faculty of International Studies, Aligarh Muslim University, uh, Aligarh. Dr. Murad, over to you. And we'll try to be brief, sir. Hello, good evening, all of you. Good evening, ma'am. It has been a great opportunity and such a privilege to hear you out, ma'am, for after a long time. We were so fond of your lectures in JNU whenever 
it happened in the hostels in the midnight in the night after dinner uh, uh, talk we used to be there all the time uh, i would like to bring to the attention of the view of the audience some of the points that uh, that is very much related to our uh, discussion today's topic that how in the in the time of pandemic corona pandemic it has been uh, what is the vision of the what is the vision of nation building and, and the nation uh, as ma'am rightly pointed out in the very beginning of her speech that how gandhi gandhi used to have a dream and all the important philosophers and the great nation builders used to see this dream that the country should have been an inclu inclusive society where there could be a space for all all kinds of minorities and particularly the largest minority of the nation how but i would like to uh, again go back to uh, a speech by our prime minister modi that he said at, at, at in in one of one of his speeches that how the pandemic uh, the corona pandemic crisis could be turned into an opportunity i certainly saw this but very negatively in a very negative manner that how the bjp and the right wing people and the government could actually turn this pandemic crisis into an opportunity to crush the voices of the people particularly seen from the point of the view of the doof of those who actually wanted to defend the democratic values of the constitution as ma'am is what are you as ma'am rightly pointed out and ma'am said in her speech in her lecture that and uh, never ever before in india at such a large scale the constitution was read out everywhere the preambles in the drawing rooms of the people also read out loudly very loud and clear message was sent never never ever after independence of india we had seen such a moment where people could actually stand out come out in large numbers and without any fear and any threat in their minds to actually defend and protect the constitutional values of our, of our democracy the constitutional values actually not only of the democracy but the vision of a nation which was actually propagated by jawaharlal nehru and mahatma gandhi ambedkar also baba bhimrao ambedkar spoke about the same how the country should have been an inclusive country an inclusive nation and that is the main point today that is faltering a lot and everybody everywhere in each and every policy of the government that is that is that is that is, that is lacking you see in last 5 to 6 years we have seen how the prime minister himself had not been ever not been ever able to dedicate any line a particular congratulatory message to the minorities and in 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 the most important occasions of the festivals of the muslims and the minorities it has been totally ignored it been ignored uh by the by, uh, recently on the occasion of vip bakrid perhaps for the first time prime minister has written something about that congratulating people on the on the occasion of, of bakrid but i'm I, again going back to again uh the the topic that how they have turned this op pandemic of crisis into an opportunity you see uh, to crush the voices of the students particularly ma'am said that it was not a movement of the minorities it was a movement of the youth people i totally agree and i i can't agree more than this that actually it was a movement of the whole people the people who are actually the struggle that we had seen before independence had the hard fought uh, battle that we had seen before independence and the inclusive nature of the battle that we had we have ever witnessed uh, before independence and after that i don't i mean we, i had not seen in my life such a large scale movement taking place in india but how this has been for example take, for example uh, citing uh one instance that how the movement of the of uh the a uh, movement in aligarh muslim university against the cna ca and nrc had been brutally crushed on the night of the 15th of december on the same night there was the brutal attack by the police in the libraries and in the campus premises of the jamia millia islamia 
and at the same time the women who were protesting in okla the women who were protesting in shahin bag it that was a democratic process it was a democratic uh, protest which was happening for a long uh, period of time for months if had they had been if they have and it, it is the right of the people to protest it's a fundamental right that the people can protest against any kind of policy of the government and why can't protest why to strengthen the voice of the government who is actually formulating policies people may go against it people do not necessarily have to go in favor of all the policies that government that the government that the government formulate in the on the house of the parliament why not going against it maybe people are maybe people are mistaken but the government has to have a proper dialogue with them but in this case the people were not mistaken everybody came all the people hindus muslims sikhs alike came women youth students uh people like hashmandar and ma'am was citing the cases of hashmandar and social activists pasan bhus and we have just seen the cases seems very ridiculous to be leveled as anti nationals and also the contempt of court the contempt of court just on the matters just on the matters of just asking raising questions on the chief justice maybe or on the institutional procedures so also how uh, batavial sir was also saying that the country had always been a country of the philosopher intellectuals academicians those who were the those who fought for the independence of the nation they were jailed lived in jail for uh, decades 10 10 years 5 years but how they let down the foundations of the nation which could be an inclusive nation i had gone to many i i had gone to many european and latin american nations and people were very happy at least 10 years before people were very happy to have me a representative of a nation which was a truly plural cultural nation and they were asking me questions they were very excited to see me that in this time in the new millennium people would would hardly find a, a nation which could actually uh, contain so so many civilizations and culture and still live in coexistence and in harmony religiously and culturally but it broke down totally in for last uh, in last 5 years so i what i would like to conclude by saying that uh, that the opportunity has been turned the crisis has been turned into opportunity but but to certain extent to a particular uh, ideological uh, alienation particular ideological inclination of the right wing and how they have been continuing with the help of rss and other organization right wing organizations who actually cannot tolerate as ma'am in the very beginning said that the gandhi gandhi ji on the 6th 7th and 8th of august said very clearly that they he was not representing the voice of the people who only wanted this country to become a uni uh, uni cultural or uni religious country or nation they actually wanted to he was a voice he was the voice of the multicultural multi religious uh, nation uh, which was india and india was was one of the few countries few nations and still remains one of the few nations where a large group of community could have been able to survive unlike other nations in the world who have always fought on the questions of religion culture but defending that defending the reasons of those people had been such a difficult task in the time of uh, uh corona virus pandemic today and also i think had there not been corona virus situation could have become even worse i guess and that is going to be continue that is going to be continued in the light of the form- uh, the implementation of the newly uh, passed bills by the parliament which is ca and nrc thank you so much i will conclude by saying the same and may we could may we uh, defend the pluricultural character of the country called india thank you thank you, thank you so much yes thank you thank you so much dr murad for raising your critical points on on secular and many other aspects for this uh, without wasting any time i'll quickly go to uh, dr richa raj ma'am are you there
Uh, yes, I'm here. Yes, let me introduce. Uh, let me introduce uh, Richa, ma'am. Yes, uh, Dr. Richa Raj is assistant professor uh, at Department of History, Jesus and Mary College, University of Delhi, uh, GMC, very famous college, and she's also a, the member of Academic Council of University of Delhi. Yes, ma'am. Over to you. Please try to be brief. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arjun Kumar, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of uh, this very important lecture by my PhD supervisor, Professor Mridla Mukherjee. Uh, it has indeed been an honor, even before ma'am knew me, I knew her uh, through her writings uh, uh, while studying for graduation in Lucknow. And uh, for, uh, for some reason, it was always that, you know, uh, in, at the back of the uh, cover of the book, India's Struggle for Independence, where along with other authors, her name was written. I was always uh, quite uh, somehow uh, quite enamored by Professor Mridula Mukherjee uh, and of course other authors of the book as well. Uh, so it has always been an honor to be a part uh, of her class, of her lectures and uh, the passion with which she uh, you know, tries to instill this idea of how it is important for India as a nation to survive. Uh, it is important for all of us to uphold the legacy of the freedom struggle. And uh, very correctly, she has said that it is not just uh, democracy uh, that one needs to uphold, but the other ideas of republicanism, of civil liberty, of secularism, socialism, as well as, of course, nationalism, which is a legacy of our anti-colonial uh, struggle. Uh, so uh, thank, thank you, ma'am, uh, for uh, a very, very good evening uh, for all of us. Uh, I would like to briefly uh, you know, uh, talk about uh, one particular aspect of our uh, Indian uh, freedom struggle, and that is egalitarianism that is enshrined in the Indian uh, constitution as well. And uh, from the point of view of a teacher, I would like to reflect upon also the education, the changes in education uh, that are being made currently again under the garb of uh, the pandemic. Uh, one is, uh, you know, this entire idea of trying to uh, pull back public funding from higher educational institutions. It is uh, something that is uh, very worrisome uh, for all of us. Uh, this is being done uh, by, uh, on the pretext that there are no financial resources available to open up new institutions and new schools, etc., and therefore open distance learning or online uh, education should be uh, pushed forward. Now, uh, one would say, uh, would, would like to say that online education is good to a certain extent of uh, making it a supplement to uh, regular education, uh, especially the way uh, uh, you know, corporatization of higher education is being done by opening up the education sector to private entities. And that is some, uh, going to be very challenging for the marginalized sections who would not have uh, so much of resources to pay for uh, the increased fee structure of the privatized institutions. Uh, even the colleges, uh, uh, what is being done in, I can speak for my university, Delhi University, is that the colleges are being pushed towards autonomy. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, that entire, uh, uh, you know, uh, push for autonomy means that uh, there would be a withdrawal of public uh, funding. And it would uh, eventually mean that we, uh, students from far-flung areas uh, would not be able to, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, come for, uh, uh, to study in uh, metropolitan study. Like something that enabled me to come, uh, uh, to come from a small town in Uttarakhand and study in Jawaharlal Nehru University because of subsidized education uh, would not be possible. Students in far-flung areas or from the marginalized sections would be pushed towards open distance learning. And I would like to uh, pose this question about how a student who has studied from by, uh, through open distance learning, what kind of a value would her certificate have in uh, the, the, the employ, uh, employment market? Uh, you know, so that is one important question when we talk about um, about egalitarianism, perhaps it is important to reflect upon how uh, the role of the government still is very important. The role of the state particularly is very important in providing uh, subsidized education uh, to the students. That is one. And uh, uh, quickly, uh, another point about, I just wanted to mention here, is that the national education policy of 2020 uh, talks about in very fancy progressive terms about holistic learning of, uh, uh, you know, foundational uh, uh, learning of 
also uh, uh, enhancing uh, essential learning and critical thinking. Uh, but in theory, it all sounds very good. But in practice, we've been seeing that in the past few years, how universities are being brought under the political might of a uh, few groups in the in the country in all ways, whether it is in, the, in uh, curriculum framework, uh, or it is in terms of students movements or participation of students uh, in, in, uh, in uh, sort of uh, trying to be critical of uh, a certain policy of the government. So, uh, uh, Professor Mukherjee, it is very important to again, uh, that you reminded us again, that uh, these ideas need to uh, be looked up to when we are framing public policies uh, for the nation. Thank you, ma'am. Over you. to you, Dr. Arjun. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Isha, for uh, uh, highlighting. Uh, we also brought the cover of the ma'am's book on the screen. We'll, we'll uh, bring it again. And for uh, also highlighting the, the point of view from universities and what is happening from the education sector, uh, without uh, losing a, any further time, we'll go to uh, Pune with to Dr. Nitin Tagre. Sir, are you there? Dr. Nitin Tagre? Yes, yes. Let me introduce you. Yes. Uh, Dr. Nitin Tagre is an assistant professor at Department of Economics at Savitri Bai Phule Pune University, Pune. Sir, over to you. Uh, thank you, Arjun, for uh, giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, and this was actually an excellent talk uh, by Professor Muridila Mukherjee. Uh, and I think it is important uh, during this pandemic, which has started not uh, uh, due to the coronavirus, but it has actually started uh, with the uh, demonetization. I say this, uh, uh, this pandemic has started with the demonetization because uh, if you see the economic growth has started falling from the demonetization in December 2016, I think. And uh, with the corona pandemic, it has again uh, became a very strongly falling. Now, looking at the uh, nation building uh, from the uh, historical point of view, we will see that uh, there are different perspectives. Uh, and uh, uh, Congress has uh, comprises of all the kinds of perspectives, but there were another perspective strongly coming from the uh, uh, egalitarian point of view, where the annihilation of caste became the more more important from the Maharashtrian point of view. Uh, if you look at uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Mukherjee has said about the economic reform is the has the human face and the connection goes back to the what dr ambedkar has pointed out in the uh, constitution assembly on 25th november 1949 where he argued that we have achieved the political democracy but it the success depends not on the political democracy but depends on the social and economic democracy. And this social and economic democracy has the connection with the human face of the economic reforms. Basically, uh, uh, before the 1991, if you look at uh, most of the uh, uh, most of the sectors were under the control of uh, the government. And uh, somehow, government has maintained that human face. But after the 1991, we, we globalized ourselves as an economy. And uh, to, re to retain that human face, uh, I would uh, uh, indicate two programs. One was already indicated by uh, the panelist and uh, um, Dr. Uh, Mukherjee, that was Manarega. And, uh, Second was food security bill. And with these two major programs, you will see that there was a major transformation in the rural, uh, rural areas. There was uh, the people uh, got the 
uh, opportunity to think to plan their uh, goals otherwise it was really difficult for them to achieve their goals and with that uh, uh, i think uh, our uh, what uh, dr brudula mukherjee has suggested all the objectives led to uh, led in the freedom uh, freedom uh, uh, fight uh, before the independence was led down in the constitution uh, constitution uh, with the with the diverse perspective being uh, being the members from different uh, background uh, i think uh, uh, we we need to uh, be more inclusive and for that purpose we we need to have our only the political democracy but also the social and economic democracy we need to think and plan according to that so that the a uh, major goal should be annihilation of caste annihilation of the uh, inequities if you see that the uh, inequality existed based on the so social background the, it is a huge about 70% of the inequality is existed in terms of the asset ownership about uh, there are 20% of the uh, population is there of scheduled caste but they own only 7.5 percent of the total assets. On the other hand, others which which are not scheduled caste, not uh, not uh, scheduled tribes, not OBCs, they 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 constitute about 30 percent of the total population, but own 53 percent of the total total uh, uh, assets in terms of the land. in terms of the building in terms of the gold in terms of the financial asset all kinds of assets uh, this is the information based on the 2013 data and you will find uh, these kinds of inequalities in terms of all the economic and non non economic uh, 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 sectors and uh, this has actually why it has if you look at why these inequalities are there because of the discrimination faced by these communities and has the impact on their income earnings and that has actually uh, 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 made the uh, 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 these gaps have widened over the period uh, i think we should uh, be thank you thank you thank you thank you so much uh, professor tagde for highlighting these four points and on stressing upon the human face of uh, uh, economic reforms uh, professor guman also highlighted the class things and sir has rightly highlighted the caste things rashmi ma'am also highlighted the gender things now uh, we'll go to dr t uh, dr t sadashivam uh, at mizoram sir are you there we can see you there um Arjun, can you can you see me? Um, yes, but sir, your video is off. Hello. Yes, we can see you. Actually, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, right. Just, so, uh, sir, yeah. just, yes, Dr. T. Sadashivam sir is assistant professor at Department of Public Administration, uh, Pachunga University College, a constituent college of Mizoram Central University at Azwal, Mizoram. Sir, over to you. Kindly try to be brief. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I would be. Uh, if you permit me, can I just uh, mute my video because in northeast, you know, it's raining heavily and uh, there will be network problem. Of course, of same. So if you permit me, I'm from Kerala. Is also yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, please. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let me uh, initially. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Arjun. It's really been after three years that we are get together again here. Uh, it's very nice to see you and. Uh, uh, it's been a wonderful for me to listen to professor uh, murudula mukherjee ma'am it's really been a, i mean a, for me it's a, like a dream always been there in delhi when i was a student always been here also so it's really been very nice to listen to them but it's always very tough to be a last in this panel to talk about but i will be very brief uh, because as i know, as all of you know i am not a historian and not an mist but uh, uh, from a angle from the administration side i would like to uh, tell you here as all of you know this topic uh, about the in the era of uh, under covid pandemic 
Now here, well, first of all, I would like to uh, take you to the Mizoram. Mizoram is here. All of you are many of you are from mainstream India. I'm the only person who are from Northeast. So I thought I I would just give you the uh, perception of what is happening in Northeast in in terms of COVID and uh, take this to the what Professor Madhula Mukherjee has talked about the principle of democracy, the the, the the especially the representative democracy. I would like. In uh, Mizoram, all of India, if you see. only there are two states in india until now the data which i which i seen in the government of india the covid death till mizoram and the lakshadweep there are still no death has been occurred because of covid so these are only two uh, two uh, states uh, one is ut one is state of course where you find that there are no uh, covid death now here the the main reason why there are uh, main reason why there is no death related to covid as the first reason is basically is community participation all of you know in north is mira being a highly literate, uh, literate state one of the literate west state and here the community participation is very much very important here and when i say community participation please uh, remember uh, it's always been a principle of a part of a democracy because we we have the leaders elected leaders but apart from the elected leaders we need to be people participate especially the community participation i don't know uh, you people have heard about yma young that is young meso association which is basically uh, Uh, 80 years old association it's a, it's like a ngo in mizoram so any any person in mizoram who is above 14 years of age can automatically become a member of uh, can become a member of this organization so here this yma which is a basically a, you can call it as a ngo or a civil society Uh, whatever you can call it basically playing in a very important role with the government in controlling the covid 19 now the question is why i'm telling you the mizoram context of community participation the reason here is now i'm taking you to back to the what uh, professor mudra mukherjee is talking about democracy now all of you know when we say democracy in india basically we have a federal system so and we have the central government state government and we have the local self government as already one of the panelists before me uh, i think uh, dr rashmi madam has already talked about the third third layer of government so my focus here will basically on the third layer of governance which is basically called panchayati raj system now here as all of you know uh, when we are talking about uh, panchayati raj institution in uh, in our draft in the in the constitution draft there is no mention of the term panchayat raj so because of lot of pressure from the indian side you will see that somehow you find the panchayati raj has been got included in the direct principles of state policy under article 40 so the question is do we really have raj in panchayati although we have brought panchayati raj constitutional amendment act 73rd in the 1990 but really panchayati has become raj that is a question mark for me that is my personal opinion that is a question mark for me now here of course during covid pandemic you all of you know in the media we have seen that how the state of kerala where the panchayati raj institution has played a very important role in controlling the covid actually in the terms of menace of the covid 19 especially in odisha you might have heard that the odisha government has basically delegated the power of the village uh, the what you call the district collector to the panchayati raj uh, there so now here the the thing which i want to tell you is that uh, does this panchayat raj it's now almost 27 years of constitution mandate now all of you see uh, when we are talking about governance so inclusive governance as the present government is also talking about inclusive governance now village democracy is very much important for inclusive governance but do we really have inclusive governance in terms of the constitutional amendment act of 73rd of i am afraid that is not the case now here i'll just go because here we have to revisit what the 73rd constitution amendment act talks about it talks about establishing the local government institution in india but if, if you see the last four three examples i can just give you some examples for example you see kashmir what happened in kashmir the panchayat election there the urban the municipality election there hardly we see there have been uncontested seats there hardly we see any people or the lead of the i mean the candidates have been standing for the election so does this means a representative does this means a true democracy or a village democracy not at all if i take to the example you go to the example of uh, bengal bengal in the last panchayat election you see number of the seats have been uncontested so there have been violence there have been so many goons all happened in panchayat election similarly the tripura local Uh, self government elections so in part of india especially in haryana and rajasthan the, the biggest 
is, is really it's very sad for me that we we say village of india is the third largest in terms of large we have largest democracy and the third of government that is uh, the panchayat raj institution we have and it is functioning very well every leader political leader is praising that including i think you have seen that in the month of april our prime minister when he was addressing on uh, the national panchayati raj day he was praising the all the sarpanches that they are playing a very important role in covid 19 but the question here is does really the panchayats are play important role except some states like kerala and odisha and here that the big challenge even after 27 years of constitutional mandate you see the big panchayati raj in india still in terms of the finance in terms of the functionaries in terms of the function of course the constitutional amendment gives 20 functional items to the panchayati raj but do they really have the finance that is the resources do they have the manpower that is functionary still is a question mark now all of you again we know that the 14 finance commission 2015 to 2020 it has given near more than 2 lakh crores to the gram panchayat only and it has been so much that a gram panchayat is getting near about uh, 85 lakh for entire year but but the again the question is that the giving money really makes them Uh, i think we have lost sir's connection so uh, in respect of time i'll just go to uh, to the chair of our session uh, we'll we can come back to indu sir after ridula ma'am has given her thoughts so uh, yes indu sir i'm stopping you <laughs> till then yes yes so chair if we can just quickly uh, reflect upon all the comments from the discussants and then we can quickly go to bridula ma'am to she can choose to answer whatsoever uh, points which have been raised and uh, and and i think the questions also we have incorporated uh, a lot and then we can also give a chance to have indu sir to have the civil society uh, perspective i think that that has been left uh, but uh, but after bridula ma'am has reflected upon upon the the comments and discussions yeah professor lin yes yeah Pro sorry Yes, sir over to you you can just have no no i think you yeah, know there is nothing for me to be if been it's been a very rich and wonderful discussion and what the subsequent discussants were able to do were they were able to pick out specific strands from the talk of mrs um, uh, professor murthula mukherjee and develop it further so i think on the whole it's been a very very enriching uh, uh, discussion there is nothing that i really have to add to it and maybe now we should uh, go over to uh, uh, whatever is listed professor yeah we should go over to professor mukherjee yes yeah thank I'm you uh i would be happy to first hear uh, dr indu prakash singh yes yeah, ma'am yes oh, okay i really wanted to take your permission because of the time limit yes indu sir please try to be brief yes thank you Okay, 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 okay. I think this was quickly. Um, you know, I'm sorry, um, Professor Mizla, that I got a bit late. Uh, but I think I entered when you were talking about civil society and the engagements and what the government is doing. And uh, thank you for mentioning some of us. Um, you know, um, and uh, I must say, um, from what I've had, that is, I think what I've heard from the discussion that really ensued after your uh, presentation. I must say, of course, it's uh, increased. Um, uh you know uh, webinars have always been of high caliber have been great in inputs and all that and i i would say that even uh, this discussion that we having is very important uh you know and uh, in fact uh, taking from where um, you actually left you know like uh, you know uh, like when you're talking about uh, india struggle for independence and uh, you know uh, from a nationalism that we had and all the stuff that came in the constitution you rightly mentioned that we somewhere have veered into sectarianism and as a civil society member who has been working with the homeless people for the last 20 years i must tell you we have um, seen the worst side of our government and especially uh, you know uh, after um, uh, bjp coming in 2014 i think we have actually seen an onslaught on the civil society you know and um, you know um, i would quickly also say here that um, 
uh, you know, for me, I think, you know, maybe I, 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 I don't know if I've given a book you, uh, to you or not, uh, Professor Mithraji, about the city makers as such, you know. Uh, I'll surely reach it to you. Maybe I'll give it to Arjun and can reach it. Or maybe I can also drop by. Uh, in the book, I have mentioned due to the work we have done with the homeless people who are actually, uh, which includes the tribals and the Dalits, the Muslims and all these people actually. Because they are uh, people who are left out of all the development parameters as such. Um, you know, so uh, I have come out with a formulation saying that uh, when we talk about um, India, of course, you know, B.G. Vaghi spoke about uh, India and Bharat. I thought that maybe that is a formulation of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But today we can talk about uh, an India and a non-India. India is a capital I-N-D-I-A where everything functions where uh, PM care functions, where uh, you know, uh, the institution function, where uh, corporates function, where um, money is raised, money is spent. And non-India is a place where all the Dalit tribals, Muslim women, children actually languish. You know, and what we saw about in the COVID times, the migrants moving and all that, nobody taking care of it, Supreme Court going totally mute, to which Prashant, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, express his ire against it that you are uh, close, you close, close on Supreme Court. So much is happening; people are dying on the streets, and you go and sit on a mobile uh, Harley Davidson, 50 lakh a moment on that, and Supreme Court takes uh, cultures against him. So, somewhere I must tell you that because we were working uh, since March, I was part of the uh, Delhi government's advisory panel on COVID. And we were trying to reach food to the people, uh, you know, right from the homeless shelters to school shelters, <clears throat> to school spaces, then to people not having ration cards. I think so we're trying all that. And here we had a central government. And I must tell you, the union government, actually we should not be calling central government in the constitution, they are actually union government, which was actually not, not cooperating with the local government at all. And this is something which I would say uh, is what is what you hinted at is sectarianism as such. And I must tell you that we have seen, like, you know, we were in the field after the riots that took place. We had to intervene. And after the riots also, every evening we used to get the calls from people from different places that uh, we are mobs are collecting. So we were calling the police and other people that listen, please stop it. So we were able to intervene. And what was the union government doing? They were doing nothing. They actually, the problem, uh, you know, which I want to really say here, which we have seen from the, you know, from the grassroots, is that today a union government is supporting criminals. We have got a state, a union government, which is engineering riots. Delhi riots is a full example of it. The government, the union government, imagine the prime minister of this country has all the time and space to go and uh, be part of the Bhumi Pujan of Ayodhya. Would any prime minister of the country should have done this actually? You are going into becoming, uh, you, you are against the constitutional ethics of this country as such. So, uh, you know, and then of course, uh, you know, um, so somewhere I personally feel that, you know, what actually is operating in India today, which I don't know how many people have seen this, but I know Professor Mildur Mukherjee must have noticed it, that we actually have a prime minister in name who operates as president of the United States of America. He actually has got all his ministers and minions, and they are nothing. Like, who would remember who's the education minister of India today? or uh, the women and child resource minister or uh, water minister or water, forest minister or whatever. I think the problem today, the problem today is basically that, you know, um, uh, I think there were friends who mentioned about, um, you know, uh, various things. I agreed with all of them. They were friends from Aligarh and other places. I agree with all the formulations. And I want to say here that, you know, while it's, it's right that uh, economy was shattered right through the measures of demonetization. You know, we have a premium release fund is scrapped. We get PM, we get PM care, uh, PM cares, which is a personal trust of the prime minister and uh, Rajnath Singh and all those people, the Nirmala Sitaraman, all those people. 
um then you spoke about you know what was the what was the real motive of having a caa and nrc you if you are a government people have voted for you first of all i also have this thing whether they were voted or whether it was the election commission which actually you know allowed them through the evms as such you know so that's also you know because uh, you know they never expected this majority at all kanhaiya kumar losing you know it's it's uh, it's it's not done it's not given you know, nobody can believe it so to so somewhere i think that you know this government knows that they are here by default they are not actually elected by the people but they are elected by the evms and that is the reason why they are using this opportunity when pm talks about covid is an opportunity they are using the recent power that they have had to destroy all the democratic institutions of the country we have a cec which uh, which actually is powerless we have cag which is powerless we have cbi which is powerless we have niti aayog which is powerless tell me one we have nhrc nothing judiciary supreme court high court state courts and all no powers at all now which is the only powerful institution today in the country is the prime minister who operates as the president of the united states of america so for many of us you know uh yes what has really happened is also that uh india has become uh you know i think what the, this prime minister has done is he has done the corporatization of india and i think today's article in times of india by uh, pavan ki varma is very interesting where he talks about and it's very i think it's 73 years of freedom very quotes and figures i want to say here where he talks about inequality where the richest one person in india owns 58.4% of the country's wealth the richest 10% of uh, the richest 10% they own a astounding 80.7% of country's wealth and the bottom 10% own only 0.2% of the country's wealth so we know that the poverty has deepened the poverty crisis has deepened the economy is shattered there are no jobs at presently so uh, you know in fact uh, professor mithila mukherji what he spoke about you know the uh, challenge that uh, the civil society is facing you know the attacks is happening on harsh mandal on uh, apurva nand and prashant bhushan and our young leaders at jnu and jamia and other universities and yes one thing i want to say is that this government has operated uh, by destroying many institutions they have attacked the universities from right from hyderabad to jnu to uh, allahabad to banaras to all these places they have gone about co-opting the media they have got the judiciary with them parliament is with them state governments uts you know what power they have they the the problem today is you know i think uh, whether they lose the election or they win the election they will make the government like we are seeing today in the, what happened in rajasthan they didn't break the government but somehow they couldn't break it thankfully but uh, pilot and all they got together and how they have dogged all the national institutions where is nhrc ncw like i think today we see i think we have i think you know what i would say is that all this various mechanisms taking place today is all actually negating the democracy the democratic foundations on which india stands today i think has been badly weakened and until unless you know we all gear up and say that listen hello mr prime minister behave you are a servant of this country and behave like a servant don't dominate us there is a constitution of india about you the constitution of india about the supreme court and you can't be dubbing us as contempt of court and defamation all those things uh satyameva jayate we talk about every court says satyameva jayate and you talk about in uh, when you sp- uh, speak the truth then you are uh, it's a contempt what are you talking about you know so um i think I'll, i'll end here i think you know because one can go on and on but i'm uh, i must tell you that it was a, it was a tremendous gain to listen to prasam mitra mukherjee and surely the uh, the input that came from other friends enriched the discussion and uh, it's because of this discussions happened that i could really add to few things and uh, you know i'm blessed to be part of this uh, session i heard it 
and thank you arjun for pulling me into it yaar i was here only as a you know as a witness to it you know i didn't want to say anything but thank you nandesh zindabad uh, zindabad thank you thank you sir satmeo jayate and uh, uh, so you have been teaching us on ground on the night of genu attack i remember i was with you also on the night of uh, jamia so all the places it's always so pleasure to have you all around at, at all the important events and uh, fighting for uh, uh, democracy few points i just have to add and then we can go to ma'am uh, ma'am uh, how what china has done and especially what our uh, bilateral relations are and uh, how they have been able not, never to be you know colonized or uh, invaded by any foreign power and and what in terms in terms of their view of Uh, their political system. You also touched upon about Middle East countries, even even those are constitutional monarchy, and how U.S. is looking into. Now, I mean, if you can also touch upon some comparative aspects between the countries and where, as a nation, we are moving with our ethos and values. Uh, so, ma'am, over to you. Well, I think Arjun, I've done more than my share for this evening. and if you are going to ask me to now talk about <laughs> comparing china and india and the us it's going to be you know it's going to be midnight before we break up so i think we should leave that for another occasion because it's a whole different story you know it you have to go into chinese history you have to go into the colonial period you have to go into you know Uh, what happened after their independence it's a very long story so i think let that be for another time uh i think uh, what i i actually just want to say that i have uh, really enjoyed being here with all of you and i have learned so much i'm very happy that i could uh, trigger off uh, so many people actually also as i felt i was also doing sharing what is in their hearts and minds you know and i think what the sense that has come to me is a very reassuring sense that there are many other people out there who are equally concerned who are equally worried who are equally pained about many things which are happening around us and who equally share the vision uh, of the freedom struggle the freedom of our the the vision of our constitution and that gives me a lot of hope and it gives me a lot of uh, reassurance that even though things look pretty bad sometimes and especially when you are isolated physically i think the sense of uh, foreboding and the sense of disillusionment becomes even uh, stronger because otherwise at least when you are with uh, like minded people and you're fighting back and you're expressing yourself <coughs> that sense of despondency doesn't come and i think one of the most important things for us is to fight that sense of despondency yes. therefore i'm also one of those who are not willing to say that we have you know for example some people are saying you know we've actually buried the ashes of uh, secularism already mm -hmm. uh, or thrown them or they you know flow in the in the saryu or wherever I, i do not buy into that frame of mind i think seeing the way i see it is that yes it is under very severe attack there is a very determined uh, effort to take us away from our borings and not just of the freedom struggle but of the i would say the entire history and culture of india uh there is a very strong attempt to take us away from that we are not going back those of us who are even hindus to our hindu roots hindutva is not even a going back to hinduism i'm sorry you know it is not even like the arya samaj are going back to the vedas you know and ridding hinduism of its impurities and what with all its problems that arya samaj had and we have richa here who's an expert on the arya samaj but it is it is a political project savarkar said i'm not interested in hinduism i'm interested in hindus as a political group so this is a political project 
which only uses religion. Okay, I think it's very important to realize that. So whether it is the Ram Mandir or whatever else you, all this is only part of a political project. It has nothing to do with the religion of the Hindus. So it's not even advancing in a sense the religious interests of Hindus as Hindus. You know, so I think I was very disappointed. In fact, I watched the whole ceremony. Apart from what I said, associating the state with a religious function, which is an obvious problem, I was disappointed that it was not even a religious ceremony in a grand sense. You know that the big religious figures of Hindu religion should have been called. Where were the Shankaracharyas? Where were other important figures? You know, where where were representatives of other religions? If you are doing such an important religious act, surely other religious heads, you know, from Buddhism, from Christianity, from Sikhism, should have been invited to make it a proper religious function, so that it's very clear that it's about religion, and it's not about, you know, your judgeman is the prime minister. I mean, surely there are. You can't. He is a Hindu, yes. But is he? Would you be able to say that, you know, he represents Hinduism at its tallest? Because that's not his profession. He's not a religious leader. He's a political le leader. So why, in a religious function, from so many points of view, should a religious body do this? It mm. it shows to me even more that it is not about religion. And I'm sorry to say that the religious people get embroiled, you know, with the politics uh, like this. It's a very, very sad uh, uh, situation. So I just uh, want to say that I learned so much from what everybody said, so many different perspectives came in. And I'm deeply grateful to all of you for appreciating my effort to raise uh, these issues. So I would like to just say thank you very much, Dr. Arjun Kumar and Impri for making this possible. And thank you very much, all the friends who have stayed on uh, for so long and participated. Thank you, Indu, even though you came in late. Thank you for uh, sharing so much and giving us your perspective, which we really value. I really value. I think you bring to us a sense of reality, you know, and we, we look to you to keep bringing to us that sense of what's going on in the real world, in a sense, because in some senses, though as academics, however much we are involved, uh, it's still a different kind of involvement from somebody like you who's given their whole life and 24 hours uh, to being out there on the streets with our people. And we really value that. So thank you, Arjun. And that's all from my side. Thank you. Th thank you so much, ma'am. And. Uh, uh... Indu sir for joining late and but also enlightening us and uh, formally uh, and now I would like to uh, we have also crossed so much of time limit uh, first of all I would like to thank uh, Professor Nritla Mukherjee for so much uh, for finding out time on, on this day for sharing with us uh, her very important comments and uh, also critiques and constructive suggestions uh, uh, f finding out threads from our freedom struggle and what India has witnessed and where are we looking especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. I especially thank uh, uh, all of the participants who have been able to join and also those who have not able to join. Uh, I, I, I deeply thank the chair for the session, Professor uh, Salil Mishra for taking out time and, and chairing this session so well. He, he has made his remarks also in the start and also after Ma'am's lecture and you know, uh, putting all the things into perspective and in context. And uh, I am so thankful to all our uh, uh, discussants who came here and, and gave their views. Uh, uh, Professor Rakesh from JNU, uh, Professor Bhuman, uh, Dr. Richa Ma'am, uh, uh, Dr. Rashmi Singh, and uh, also BP sir could not join. He was there and uh, uh, many a times he tried to join in also to, to share the, the point of view from uh, other places. Uh, and then we also had uh, Dr. Murad Khan from Aligarh Muslim University sharing uh, sharing their experiences with us. Uh, Dr. Nitin Tagre from Pune. Uh, 
Dr. Anuni, ma'am from Kerala, could not connect because of rains, but she has also sent some questions. But those have been covered, of course. And then Dr. Uh, uh, TC from Mizoram also uh, for uh, bringing out point. And finally, uh, Dr. Indu Prakash Singh, sir. And uh, I thank you all of you, all the participants and the IMPRI team, IMPRI IT team, uh, Dr. Simi Mehta, uh, Bharat Singh, sir, our, all our research team, and uh, Anshula Ritika, and IT and other team members. And we wish you a good evening and happy Independence Day. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Prasam Ridla Mukherjee, once again. And we look forward to listening more to you, reading more to you again and again, and guided by your light. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Have a night.